I am Nicole Austin Hillary, and I'm the director and counsel of the Washington, D.C. office of the Brennan Center for Justice. Thank you all for joining us this evening for what will be a very lively and important discussion. Uh, we would like to thank our friends here at the NYU uh, D.C. campus for hosting uh, this discussion tonight. Uh, and I want to let you all know, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the Brennan Center, we are a national think tank legal advocacy strategic communications litigation organization. Say that fast 10 times and you'll get the prize. Uh, we like to do what we call fix those broken parts of our systems of justice and democracy. Our work ranges from issue areas including voting rights to money in politics to helping to end mass incarceration to helping to keep our courts fair and trying to oversee liberty and national security issues here in the United States. So we are pleased that we have very wonderful and smart colleagues, like my colleague Lauren Brooke Eisen, who's written a very timely book uh, that we will discuss this evening, um, because this is also the kind of work that we do to help fix those broken parts of our systems of justice and democracy. So we're pleased to have you here with us this evening for this event. Uh, and please note that you can continue to keep track of all of our events at the Brennan Center, uh, our videos, our podcasts, and our advocacy work uh, by going to brennancenter.org, and you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to first start off by introducing uh, who the, the speakers for this evening. First, uh, having the honor and privilege of introducing my colleague again, Lauren Brooke Eisen, um, whom we lovingly call LB. LB is a senior counsel. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and it is with love that we call her LB. Um, I'll be a senior counsel in our justice program at the Brennan Center, uh, where she focuses on improving the criminal justice process through legal reforms, specifically how the criminal justice system is funded. LB is the author of, uh, of Inside Private Prisons, An American Dilemma in the Age of Mass Incarceration, which she will be discussing with you this evening. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, LB was a senior program associate at the Vera Institute of Justice in the Center on Sentencing and Corrections, where she worked on policies that aim to improve public safety while reducing prison populations. She also served as an assistant district attorney in the New York City, in the New York County District Attorney's Office, where she served in the Appeals Bureau. She's also worked on a wide range of misdemeanor and felony cases while, uh, her, while in that office. Before entering law school, she covered uh, criminal, uh, she worked as a beat reporter for a daily newspaper in Laredo, Texas, where she covered criminal justice issues. LB has taught an undergraduate seminar on mass incarceration at Yale. She served as an adjunct instructor at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and she supervises uh, NYU law students who participate in the Brennan Center's Public Policy Advocacy Clinic. Uh, her work has been published by numerous organizations, including by the Vera Institute of Justice, the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology, the, Lo the Loyola University, uh, New Orleans College of Law, Journal of Public Interest Law, uh, as well as with the Marshall Project. Uh, LB is, uh, is, is someone who is also a member of the Princeton University family, where she's an alumnus, and she received her JD from the Georgetown University Law Center right here in Washington. So please join me in welcoming Lauren Brooke Eisen. <laughs> LB is joined tonight uh, by someone else whom I have the privilege of introducing, Glenn Martin. Glenn is the founder and president of Just Leadership USA. It's an organization dedicated to cutting the U.S. correctional population in half by the year 2030. Glenn is, yes, pause for that. That's wonderful. Glenn is part of the vanguard of advocates working to make that, that future a reality for us. His goal is to amplify the voice of the people most impacted and to position them as reform leaders. At its core, just leadership challenges the assumption that formerly incarcerated people lack the skills to thoughtfully weigh in on policy reform. Rather, just leadership is based on the principle that people closest to the problem are also the people closest to its solution. Mr. Martin speaks from personal experience, having spent six years incarcerated in a New York State prison in the early 1990s. That experience has informed his career, which has been recognized with numerous honors, such as being the 2016 Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Awardee and, the, and having received the 2014 Echoing Green Black Male Achievement Fellowship. Mr. Martin is also the founder of the hashtag Close, Close Rikers campaign, 
Prior to funding ju founding Just Leadership, he was the vice president of the Fortune Society, one of the most respected re-entry organizations in the United States, and he was the co-director of the National Higher Network at the Legal Action Center. Mr. Martin is a bold leader uh, who has been recognized by leaders from across the political spectrum, and we are very proud to have him as a partner with us here at the Brennan Center, where he works with us on numerous criminal justice issues. So please join me in welcoming Glenn Martin. And the conversation this evening will be led by Laura Jarrett. And we are very happy to have her here with us today. Uh, she is a correspondent with CNN, uh, and she's a reporter for CNN based here in the Washington, D.C. Bureau. And I have to tell you that we were a little frightened that she might not be able to join us this <laughs> evening because she was recently covering the Menendez trial in New Jersey. Um, and as you all know, it, it, was a, it was full of high drama, but it ended in a mistrial uh, last week. So we are very happy, not necessarily at the mistrial, but that she is able to join us here this evening. <laughs> Prior to joining CNN, CNN, uh, Laura worked as a litigation attorney in Chicago. Uh, while in private practice, she focused on defending companies and individuals in government investigations brought by the Justice Department and the Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as complex commercial litigation. Ms. Jarrett also devoted significant time to pro bono cases, including the representation of a sex trafficking victim who successfully used a new Illinois law to expunge her past convictions. That's what we like, creative lawyering. <laughs> Prior to practicing law, Ms. Jarrett served as a judicial law clerk for the Honorable Rebecca Palmeyer on the Northern District of Illinois, and later for the Honorable Ann C. Williams on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Ms. Jarrett attended Harvard Law School, where she was Articles Selection Co-Chair, an Articles Editor, and a Technical Editor for the Harvard Journal of Law and Gender. And she published several articles of her own on the intersection of gender, violence, and the law. When she graduated in 2010, Ms. Jarrett was admitted to practice law in both state and federal courts in Illinois. But we are so happy that her career has taken her to the journalism world and that she is here with us this evening to lead us in this conversation. So without further ado, I will turn this evening over to Laura. Thank you. Well, thank you for that warm introduction, Nicole. I am thrilled to be here with Glenn and LB for what I expect to be a fantastic discussion about LB's new book, Inside Private Prisons. So LB, if you could, can you level sight for us and for the audience, what exactly is the main difference between a privately run prison and a state-owned prison or operated prison? And I just want to um, echo Laura's um, welcome. And I'm so grateful that you're here. And I'm so grateful to be on a panel with Glenn Martin. And thank you to the Brennan Center for all of your efforts putting this together. So the, the book does examine the differences between um, the public prisons and private prisons. And I set out to answer a number of questions as I worked on this book, as I researched this book. The questions that I sought to answer are, what does it mean for a for-profit company to own and operate prisons and jails? Do they save money? Um, are they better places, worse places? Um, even if they do save money, even if some of the individuals incarcerated in these private prisons and private detention centers um, say they've had a better experience, does that still validate the industry? And really, at the end of the day, I think the most important question is, how in 2017 have we delegated such a core government responsibility to the private sector? You know, this is the book talks a lot about privatization and the history of privatization. And you know, we have privatized a lot of government. We've privatized trash services and waste, other waste management. And, education and health care. But it's very different when we talk about privatizing corrections, because these are human beings who are incarcerated in these prisons and in these detention centers. And really, at the end of the day, what I also sought to do was look at this subject in a very even-handed way. So to do that, I interviewed incarcerated individuals who are today behind bars in private prisons and in immigration detention centers. I visited immigration detention centers that are private and prisons that are private. I corresponded with incarcerated individuals via email, via JPay, um, where you have to actually pay 55 cents to email someone, and then you include a stamp so they email you back. Um, I interviewed directors of corrections, academics, mayors of small towns that have lured 
prisons and private prisons to their towns, hoping that the, the prisons will create jobs. And I spoke to private prison officials themselves. And it was important to me that I really look at look at this issue through the eyes of everyone that a prison and a private prison touches. And at the end of the day, you, know, you started the question saying, what are the differences? When you're in some of these facilities, they may look and feel the same as a government facility. Um, but once you start peeling back the layers of the onion, they are very different um, for, for many reasons. And some of those are that these private prisons lack transparency and accountability the way that some government prisons do. And we're talking about, you know, I think Glenn would agree with me, it's very hard for advocates, journalists, families of incarcerated individuals to find out what happens in any prison, in any jail in this country. But when you talk about the private sector owning and operating these prisons, they're not subject to the same, at the federal level, the Freedom of Information Act laws, and at the state level, the open disclosure requests. So when we journalists, researchers, academics, families of incarcerated individuals try to find out what's happening behind those doors, it's made even more difficult. And you know, the book, it, the, I lay out in the book just how difficult it was to gain access to these facilities. Um, and eventually, I was never able to gain access to these facilities through the corporations themselves. It was only through the government. And um, I, I did most of my research under the Obama administration. And I was able to gain access to private detention centers through ICE. And I was eventually able to gain access to private prisons through the directors of corrections themselves, but never through these corporations. So Glenn, one of the things that LB discusses is this issue of the fact that privatization isn't new. And there's a lot of industries that use privatization, and sometimes for good. But I'm wondering, from your perspective, is there something special about prison? Is there something fundamentally problematic with the privatization of a prison system as compared to an ambulance, per se? Sure. I think the existence of private prisons is actually just morally distasteful. That's my opinion as an advocate. Um, here's why. So if you look at the arc of mass incarceration and how we got here, uh, one might argue that, well, government-run institutions aren't run well either, that they're not very transparent either, that they don't have great outcomes. But I think that what ended up happening is that huge failure rate of our criminal justice system uh, suddenly became a success rate of the private prison industry. because. You took uh, an industry that already existed with government where two-thirds of people go back within three years and realize that if you can structure your contracts in a way that take advantage of that, um, that it can be a win-win situation for the investor for Wall Street. And so here's a system that people enter that already feels um, hypocritical. You know, as someone who served time, in a prison for six years, what really struck me was that I was in a place that had the word correction written all over the place, and there, there wasn't much evidence of correction happening. In fact, the system itself uh, was often showing me evidence of it being more corrupt uh, than any uh, community I grew up in as a young person of color growing up in Brooklyn, New York. And now you have the privatization of the industry, and you have this new lobby that's been created to not just push on sentencing laws and come up with more stringent criminal justice policies, um, but really to take, um, to take the, the sort of decision making away from the public. I mean, essentially, when you wanted to build a prison, you had to have a bond to build a prison, which means that the public got involved in that discussion, and private prisons created an alternative. And they built these prisons on, spec on speculation, um, in addition to the fact that they were also lobbying legislatures around the country, particularly in the 80s and, and 90s. And, and so here, you, you look back now on 45 years of criminal justice policy making, and you have to ask yourself how much of it is really driven by crime, uh, because crime was actually going down as we were building more and more uh, institutions, but also how much of it was built um, by this private lobby. And if you look now, uh, particularly during the Obama administration, when we were beginning to have a really meaningful and robust conversation about mass incarceration, uh, particularly having it move into popular culture, 
you saw the evolution of the industry, where now the industry is involved in the privatization of probation and parole and community-based treatment and reentry and, um, and all of the other things that have grown actually alongside our criminal justice system, uh, not to mention uh, the movement towards immigration and how heavily they've been weighing in on immigration policy. So I want to follow up on that because you're talking about speculation. And one of the things that you write, LB, is that the privatization trend emerged as three realities coalesced. <coughs> the rising belief in the potential of the free market, the skyrocketing number of prisoners, and three, the price tag of mass incarceration. So do you want to flesh out a little bit, just as Glenn was saying, how we got here? Because there weren't always private prisons. They've been around a lot longer than I realized after having read this. But just kind of back up and talk about how, how we found ourselves here and what are the, some of the elements that brought this together. Well, exactly as Glenn just said, um, the, the private sector stepped in at a very crucial time in the mid-1980s. And this was a time when about three quarters of states were under some sort of federal court order to reduce prisons. Prisons were inhumane, unhygienic, unsafe. Prisons were bursting at the, at the seams in over half of the states in this country. And directors of corrections, they, didn't, they couldn't handle these um, the increase in prison populations, and they were doing a terrible job of running prisons. And because of that, what happened is um, some very entrepreneurial investors got together. Um, the first group was Corrections Corporation of America. Most people may know them as CCA. They've just rebranded, and they're now Core Civic. Core Civic. Yes. They rebranded last year. And CCA, in 1985, saw what was happening across the country, but specifically they're, they're headquartered in, in Nashville, in Tennessee. And at the time, Governor Alexander's wife, Honey Alexander, was an early investor in CCA. And CCA made an unprecedented, pre unprecedented offer in 1985. They offered to take over Tennessee's entire prison system for $250 million and a 99-year lease. And the offer was so unprecedented that the New York Times ran an above the fold article about it. And the governor thought about it, and the attorney general um, was mortified. And you know, eventually, they rejected CCA's offer. But what they did do was, two year, was they, the next year, they passed legislation that opened the door for the private prison industry to start to own and house incarcerated individuals in prisons in the state. Four years later, uh, private prison corporations, they ran about 22 prisons. So it took only four years to really start to become entrenched in American corrections. And then by 1994, if you read their annual report that year, the CCA's annual report notes, you know, there are untapped market forces in this population. And you know, the language of the report is all about um, how much money they will make off of this trend of incarcerating individuals. But the reason why this is such an important moment for the private prison industry in the mid-1980s is because policymakers did not have to have the tough conversations about why we're incarcerating so many individuals, why so many people who violate our criminal code are sent to jail or prison instead of looking to alternatives to incarceration or um, community service, or so many other outcomes other than sending people to jails or prisons. And the private prison industry really became this safety valve. And there were, there were no conversations. That, you know, I write in the book, there was a task force. Um, there were some um, nonprofit groups working in Tennessee at the time, working with the state to try to look at alternatives to incarceration and try to reduce its state's prison population. But those conversations were very rare at the time. And I think that's a really critical moment. And you know, a lot of people, you know, even the book notes, the private prison industry did not create mass incarceration. We have 2.2 million people behind bars today. We would have had mass incarceration with or without the private sector. But the private sector did not sit idly by and watch this happen. They certainly played a significant role in their there are a lot of places um, in, the, in the book notes where the private prison industry was so powerful at American Legislative Exchange Council meetings, sending lobbyists to state legislator, legislatures, sending lobbyists you know, to the, on the Hill, 
Um, they've hired consultants to take directors of corrections to dinner and you know, wine them and dine them. There are so many places where they are impactful, but I think we really do need to go back to the 1980s um, because we could have had those tough conversations about why we are sending so many people to jails and prisons in this country, and we just never did. But it also sounds like, Glenn, that it, there's a, an incentives issue there that's just fundamentally sort of divergent, right? The more bodies you get in, the more money is made. Is that, is that consistent with what you found in your work? Right. So we live in a country where you know our 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, <laughs> except for having been, been duly convicted of a, of a crime. And so here's an industry that realizes that not only can you get paid for running the institution itself, but if you can have access to this free or low wage labor to turn around and sell to other industries, then it becomes a win-win. You're sort of winning on both ends, which is why the contracts are structured the way they are, uh, calling for those facilities to stay full. Because it's not just about getting paid for running the facility. You need the actual labor to turn around and, you know, historically at least, make clothes for Victoria's Secrets and for Eddie Bauer and McDonald's <coughs> and all these other companies that were relying on that prison labor for uh, low-wage labor. But, you know, I got to tell you, I mean, for me, private prisons are just part of a larger sort of insidious growth of our criminal justice system. The entire, even alternatives to incarceration, um, I can argue, sort of grew alongside our prison system in a way that I don't think we asked ourselves the very, really fundamental questions about, are we running a criminal justice system that is equitable and fair? Because, I mean, for, for hundreds of years in this country, there's been a successful diversion program. It's called white skin and privilege. And I think if we treated everyone who stood in front of a judge the way we treat people with white skin and privilege, we'd have totally different outcomes. Instead, what we do is we often, it's a system built on risk. And so we're always asking ourselves, well, particularly judges, like, what can I do to mitigate the risk? So whereas 20, 30 years ago, a person may have been sent home to get treatment in a community-based program, now we keep people tethered to the criminal justice system. And, and so I just want to be careful to say, yeah, private prisons are part of the problem, in my opinion, but I can dissect the entire system. Like, I, I can <coughs> dissect the entire system and show you many different places where there's been outgrowth of a system that was already insidious to begin with. Um, where I would argue that as we move to end mass incarceration, we need to be careful not to actually end up with less people in jail, in prison cells and uh, more people under correctional supervision. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have 2.3 million people in jails and prisons on any given day, but we also have another 4 million under other forms of criminal justice supervision. And these private industries, if you look at electronic monitoring, for instance, they have just as strong of a lobby around uh, the idea of moving people onto electronic monitoring as they do to move people into prisons. And what's wrong with that? <coughs> well. If I'm a judge and there's someone standing in front of me and 10 years ago there was no electronic monitoring, I may have said, you know what, you should just go home and report back and let us know how treatment is going. Now I'm like, okay, I'm going to put that person under electronic monitoring. And if they fail with the electronic monitoring, then guess what? They're more severely punished than they would have been had I not had that mechanism in the first place because as a judge, I feel as though I gave them a chance. And so I just want to be careful for us to have that broader conversation. And to that point, uh, Geo Group and CoreCivic, the two corporations that have the market share of private prisons in, this, in, in the U.S., in 2015, um, they earned about $4.5 in revenue, just those two corporations combined. And what they're doing right now is they're reading the tea leaves, and they see that a lot of states are starting to de-incarcerate. So I think 27 states reduced incarceration over the last decade, but these corporations are starting to buy up electronic monitoring Because they feel centers. like there's a mood change. They can well, feel they know that, that yeah. they're, they know that's a, that's a profit-making area. So they're buying electronic monitoring systems, the um, halfway houses, drug treatment centers. You know, last week alone, CoreCivic bought drug treatment centers in three states. And they're moving into this community corrections field where, you know, for probation, parole, electronic monitoring. And it's very profitable because they're seeing that as we do start to slowly you know, reduce prison populations in some states and at the federal level, that's where they're going to make their money. And so when, what, why that's scary, it's a lot of people say, well, why, why does that matter? At least you know, it's better than incarcerating people. But their incentive structure is not to reduce recidivism. Right? Right. Their incentive structure is not, 
let's set you up with housing and um, resources and jobs so that we don't see you in our halfway house or electronic monitoring center again. Their incentive is you know, to make money. So one of the main arguments in favor of privatization is cost. But your book, and it seems like your research has shown, that doesn't actually really bear out. It doesn't. So private prisons have been around now since about 1985. And there have been dozens of studies, some of which have been funded by the private prison industry. So you, you, can't, you can't count those in your, lit, your literature review when you're reviewing all the studies. Um, but there are very few studies that you know, some of the studies might say, well, in this state, the private prison, you know, reduced costs 1%, 2%. But even those studies, you really have to discount because they're not taking into account the cost of monitoring. Um, the budget, the city budgets, state budgets are so different. When you look at public budgets and the private corrections budgets, it's very hard to compare the two. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the book makes the point, Three and a half decades later, we don't see this promised cost savings. You know, that head of CCA was on 60 Minutes in 1985 with Morley Safer saying, you know, the government's doing a lousy job. We're going to innovate. We're going to do so much better. We haven't seen that innovation. And, and you can read about it in the book. I specifically asked Core Civic. I said, tell me how you've innovated. Send me your reports. Can I come down to Nashville and meet with you and tour facilities with you? I really I want to see your innovation, and they never responded to that. Um, so that, that's a problem. Glenn, I'm curious in your work, has, have you seen any difference in how the prisons actually operate in terms of programming or life skills training, things that's actually offered? In talking to incarcerated families, have they told you things are actually different on the ground in prisons <coughs> that are privately run and, and for profit? So I find myself in rooms more and more lately with folks who work for some of these private prison institutions. And rhetorically, they talk about an interest in programming and supporting people in reentry and so on. Um, speaking to people who've actually ter served time in those facilities, what I hear over and over is not only uh, are they uh, less than comparable to state-run institutions where there's more transparency, um, but they're more dangerous. Um, and they feel as though the people who are working there has, have less of an interest um, in, in, in the outcomes in terms of uh, access to family members and social services and reentry programs and so on. So, uh, you know, it's anecdotal, but of course data is a compilation of our anecdotes. But anecdotally, for, for the last decade and a half that I've been doing this work, I have not heard anyone hold up a private institution as doing any better than state-run facilities. And what I've heard over and over is how unsafe people felt in those facilities. And then if money alone, uh, just going back to the uh, economic conversation, if money alone drives uh, this movement towards decarceration, then we have a problem. I mean, we have to have a value-driven <coughs> discussion about how we got here. What are the values that drive our current system, which are mostly uh, uh, retribution and um, uh, punishment? And there's a place for that in our criminal justice system, but it doesn't seem to be much room for rehabilitation and transformation and parsimony and proportionality and those sort of things. And I don't think the private prison industry comes along and does much of anything to help shift that conversation. They're just totally not incentivized to do so. And I know you got some pretty extraordinary access in reporting for, out for this. Did you, when you talk to folks who are actually incarcerated in private prisons, is that consistent with what you were hearing as well? It is consistent. And interestingly enough, some of the individuals I spoke with said that they had a better experience at their at a private prison. And it wasn't because they were getting better programming. It was because there were less correctional officers. Mm. And they felt that they were left alone a little bit. Mm. And the correctional officers um, may not have had as much training as they did in the state system. And they were allowed to have video gaming equipment and things that they weren't allowed to have in the state system. And the, every single person I spoke to, I, I said, well, I'm going to play devil's advocate. You've just told me you don't want to go back to you know, Vermont, or you don't want to go back to your home state. Um, what do you think about when you know, you, you know you're at a private prison, you know there's a CEO who's making a profit off of you, and lot, you know, a lot of corporate officials who are making money off of this prison, does that bother you? And every single person I spoke to 
said yes, and, 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 and hmm. you know, I quote some of them in the book, you know, it's this idea that someone who has, you know, society has decided that someone should lose their liberty and that the government has outsourced this to a corporation to make money off of them. You know, there are real questions of morality. Um, you know, the book makes a lot of recommendations to reform the industry, but also acknowledges at the end of the day, even if we do reform the industry, what does this say about America? What does this say about us, about our government, that we have outsourced, that we have allowed people to make a profit off of what's you know, human, and some human misery. I mean, people are miserable when they're behind bars. And we haven't even spoken about immigration detention yet. But you know, when we discuss, when we have these discussions, we have to discuss morality. We have to discuss, even if you reform the industry, what does this say about our society that we have allowed a for-profit corporation to do this? And it seemed like some of the officials from the Department of Corrections, I think Wisconsin was one, he seemed to understand that and seemed to feel that tension as well. Do most of the, the folks on the grounds that, that you talk to, are they, are they opposed to this? Or mm -hmm. they, do they feel like we need this because of the overcrowding issue? What do people say who you talk to? So I spent some time in Colorado and in New Mexico and in Texas. And the Colorado um, Director Ramish, who's the head of the Colorado Department of Corrections, is a pretty progressive mm -hmm. uh, director of corrections. And he, he had been in Wisconsin, and then he ended up um, at the helm of the Department of Corrections in Colorado, and he inherited this. So he inherited, I think at the time when I was in Colorado, it was six prisons that were private. And we talked about it, and you know, to him it was this sort of practical, well, I have these six prisons, there's not much I can do about it. But you know, when we, we drove out together and in the car on the way home, we were talking about how the um, prison projections were going up, and he was really worried that he would have to rely on the private prison industry even more because he didn't have capacity in his state. Um, there are other directors of corrections, A.T. Wall in Rhode Island. They don't have any private prisons in Rhode Island. And I spoke to him and I said, well, what would you do if you were forced to use them? And he said, I wouldn't be forced to use them. Mm. You know, I would, I would go to my policymakers once I started to see that we were starting to see an uptick. And I would ensure that we were able to get a handle on this. I wouldn't allow that to happen in my state. So you know, there's a mixed bag, um, but I think at the end of the day, even directors of corrections um, wrestle with this idea. Um, you know, the ones I spoke to in this book, uh, I think, are fairly progressive directors of corrections, and, and they say their job is to you know, rehabilitate individuals, and, and that's certainly at odds with the incentives in the private prison industry. One of the other things LB touches on, Glenn, is sort of the politics of prisons, and I know you're doing uh, a lot of interesting work surrounding closing Rikers. And I wonder whether in the <coughs> switch in administrations, have you seen sort of, um, because the Trump administration hasn't shown uh, as much interest in criminal justice reform, have you seen people sort of filling that void and that gap now on the outside? Yeah, I think people uh, often forget that before the Obama administration came along and was actually really good on this issue, that that work uh, rests on top of about a decade and a half of work that was already happening in local jurisdictions on the state level. Um, and I say that because, you know, 90 percent of the people in cages in this country and under supervision are in states or localities. And so what I've seen actually is while there's been some tough on crime rhetoric coming out of this administration, one, there's about a decade and a half also of research that we didn't have before to tell a different story than what we're hearing coming out of DC. And that's been helpful. There's the fact that a field has sort of coalesced around criminal justice reform. And I think that momentum has also been helpful. But what I've seen is really a doubling down on the fact that we can actually get things done locally, even while this madness is happening on the federal level. And our Close Rikers campaign is an example of that. I mean, you have arguably one of the most progressive mayors in the country, Mayor de Blasio, in a city where we had a jail with 22,000 people in it at one point. When I was serving time there, there were 22,000 people in a facility that's only meant to hold uh, 14,000. Uh, but it's 10 jails on an island, mass incarceration model. And now the population has been cut in half. We're down to 9,500 um, over the last 20 years or so. And so here's an opportunity to uh, cut the population again by half and shutter the entire thing so that New York City no longer has this mass incarceration model in place. You end up with half the number of beds. You end up with 5,000 beds. 
And so now you have to make more difficult decisions if you have less beds. And we live in a state, I live in a state where our constitution doesn't allow for the privatization of prisons. And so, again, I, I mean, the reason we're running such an ambitious campaign is one, Rikers has become sort of the epitome of everything that's wrong with mass incarceration in this country. But two, we believe that if we can be successful here, it'll inspire folks around the country to think more boldly. Because I think we're not going to get out of this through incrementalism. Um, and so the private prison conversation is a way into the discussion, because I think, particularly because it forces us to focus on what are our values, what's really driving our uh, mass incarceration model, our public safety, our approach to public safety. Um, but not because if you got rid of all private prisons, you suddenly solve mass incarceration, because you actually, you actually don't. Um, but when I, when I sit here and listen to you talk about the utilization of labor and those sort of things. I remember when I served time in prison, we would make signage for the superintendent to take back to his private condominium complex to put outside. We would make, uh, in fact, the mayor's office in New York City, they're the largest purchaser of uh, office equipment that's made by people in prison who are making $40 every two weeks. And so this private prison industry didn't come from nowhere. It came from some of the perverse incentives that live in our government institution. But I do think the doorway through the conversation of private prisons forces us into a conversation that's not just about dollars and cents. It's about what are our values? What do we care about? What are we doing here? What are the outcomes we're getting? And can we build a smaller, fairer, more humane criminal justice system? So I think we're going to get to some questions from the audience soon. But for right now, a brief programming note for our podcast audience who might be listening at home. This is NYU Law <coughs> School's Brennan Center for Justice program. And we're talking about private prisons with Glenn Martin, founder and president of Just Leadership USA, and Lauren Brooke Eisen, senior counsel for Brennan Center's justice program, the author of this new book, Inside Private Prisons. I'm Laura Jarrett, your moderator. You can follow NYU Law School's Brennan Center for Justice on Facebook and Twitter. And all their videos and podcasts are on their website, brennancenter.org. So LB, one of the things you touch on at the end of the book is where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. What are the steps for reform? Can you lay out some of the kind of what you think of as almost like baseline things that you talk about, you know, redoing the contracts, for instance? So. The book takes the political and practical um, sort of reality that private prisons are not going away today. They're not going away tomorrow. They're not going away next year. Uh, when I was writing the book, um, it was under the Obama administration. And you know, lo and behold, President Trump is elected as president of the United States. And our reliance on the private prison industry has increased. Uh, significantly since the beginning of his administration uh, in this t in the 2018 budget his administration requested 1.2 billion dollars to increase capacity for immigration detention <coughs> beds and uh, you know in this country when we talk about private prisons some people might be aware that there are state and federal private prisons but we have essentially privatized immigration detention in this country 65 percent of ice detention beds are private. Compared to only like 7% for regular prisoners. Right. That right. Well, you're talking about a smaller population. Yeah. But still, I mean, we have, we have certainly privatized immigration detention in the US. And under the Trump administration, the private prison industry is, is going to greatly benefit from our immigration <coughs> detention policies, from increasing the number of detention beds. We've ar already started to see. Um, new federal contracts for private prisons under the Trump administration. So that's the perspective of the book, ultimately, is there are hundreds of thousands of people who cycle in and out of private prisons, private jails, private detention centers. And we do owe it to them to make their lives better, improve transparency, accountability, reduce recidivism rates um, while we can. Um, and you know, that's, that's a, the very specific recommendations. And the book essentially says we need to tear up all the contracts that exist today, and government needs to rewrite those contracts. We need to require corporations to improve programming. We need to require them to focus on job skills and, and connect people who are behind their bars to reentry services and jobs when they're released. We need to ask them and require that they beat the government's lousy 75% recidivism rate. We need to require them to, um, to 
um, comply with the federal, uh, the, with FOIA laws and with state open records requests. I mean, it's absolutely crazy that we're, at, we're letting the private sector run prisons and jails and run these detention centers and not asking them to comply with the same disclosure requests that government's required to. So as a journalist, I would love to be able to FOIA of a private prison. And, and, and it's, it's very hard to get access to yeah. these facilities. And, and these are bare minimum, right? I mean, these are not complicated things. They're not even innovative, right? I mean, these are just the things we need to require the private prison industry to do in order to get these contracts. And, and something additional that we need to do is we need to increase the fines. So I was in New Mexico at a private prison and I spent the day with one of their monitors, and afterwards he sent me a letter that the director of corrections in New Mexico sent to CoreCivic, fining them, I think it was about $25,000, for a whole host of um, non-compliance activities, you know, not having enough correctional officers, which is common in private and public facilities, um, for not releasing people on the release dates. You know, there was sort of a laundry list of things, but $25,000 know, to a company that's earning Billions, billions of dollars a year is not really going to affect how they do business. And so these corporations um, will often, you know, they will specifically not comply with the contracts because it's cheaper. You know, it's cheaper to get fined than hire more corrections officers. Mm -hmm. So we really need to increase these fines. And they're pretty concrete recommendations and they're pretty basic. And I think at the very least, if government is going to continue to contract with private corporations, you know, while these companies exist, we have to hold their feet to the fire and ask them to do better. Well, and what are some of the one of some of the wish lists you would have? I know access for families is a is a big one. I, I think transparency is hugely important. I, I would sort of mirror what LB said here. I think that uh, again, for our private institutions, government institutions, that I think that light, light, and more light is what we need in our criminal justice system. Um, at the same time, I mean, if you look, go back to the Rikers Island conversation. We spend $270,000 per bed per year on Rikers, and that hasn't been enough to inspire New Yorkers to say we should shut the place down. <laughs> but I got to tell you, there was a story of a child named Khalif Browder who was sent to Rikers, innocent, uh, spent three years there, got beat up repeatedly by correction officers and detainees, tried to kill himself five times, and then came home and was so traumatized he ultimately committed suicide. And I, I tell you, the story of his life and his death actually was more catalytic towards uh, our campaign to get the New York mayor to ultimately say um, that he was going to close Rikers than the cost of running a place like that. And so I think that we have to have a multifaceted um, uh, conversation about what's not working. But I think that, you know, I'm going to just keep beating this drum that we need to also be having a conversation about our values. So I think Albie and, and Glenn would love to hear from some, some of you. We'd like to keep it to uh, a one-part <laughs> question, if we could, in the interest of time. Maybe we can start over here on the left. OK, thank you. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. And I think this is very timely and probably actually a little bit related. Because in the currently now, it's not just for profit how much you gain per uh, per uh, in detainee or prisoners. <coughs> they are basically for a m maximum of profit. When I say profit, it's not just uh, compare the cost and uh, the <coughs> expenditure they in occur or incur to, the, to their prisoners, but also how do they victimize the, the, the prisoners and their family? You know, they can take away their rights their income, their asset, almost everything totally. So if you want to appeal, there's no way you have no resource and nobody's on your side because our system is really rigged. Really rigged. Yeah. So and, 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 and I think this time of things, election is all affected. So unless we change the system, it's very hard to, to make a correction. And, uh, I just wonder if you have examined the, let's say, rehab center or hospitals, they are now used uh, basically just like prison because they are victimized. Send people to rehab center, they take the uh, with people to the rehab or hospital, and they ch ship and transfer from one site to another. 
So basically, they can be sent to us a life sentence type, and then they take away all their resources they have, then their income, and they cannot really enjoy any benefit, even a bad benefit at all. So I thought, when you, if you have a study of this, we have to build this all together. <coughs> you cannot isolate it, just a black or white. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. Have, I'll bet you don't want to take that one. Or even minority immigrants, everybody, when yes. they are victimized. Yes, and, um, and, and the book looks at immigration detention centers, which are filled with civil detainees. A lot of people don't realize that people in these immigration detention centers have never been convicted of violating any criminal law. These are people, a lot of whom I interviewed, who said they literally walked over the border and held their hands up and said, I'm seeking asylum. And they're spending months in detention centers. And you're right, you talked about mental health problems. You know, I think about 50% of people behind bars today have a mental health or a, you know, some, some sort of issue with drugs. And so these are all problems that are um, very large parts of our criminal justice system and our immigration detention center. So thank you for your question. I think. Hi, yeah. my name is Dina Modiano Fox. And I wanted to know, as you I'm sure know, I don't know if everybody else knows, but uh, there are usurious rates for phones that if you want to put any money into a prisoner's account, you can do it online by paying an additional fee. Uh, there are all sorts of fees involved in uh, paying for incarceration privately, the individual, the families, what they have to do. So I was wondering if any of that money went to the private prisons. Hmm. Did they, do they get a cut off of the phone rates, for example, or the amount of money that families put in for an additional mm -hmm. prisoner? Uh, and then my second question was whether, and it's going to be very quick, sorry <laughs> about that, well, whether you have seen any indication that private prisons are actually lobbying to alter sentencing laws in order to increase them or make them more onerous. Um, yes, yeah, so to the second question, uh, when I was researching the book, and, and Glenn can probably speak to this too, on their websites, they, you know, big bold letters, we do not lobby policymakers for any criminal justice policies. Um, but you really, they educate, right? They say they educate policymakers. And I spoke to some lobbyists who work for these corporations. I know they exist. Um, they, they clearly lobby at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level. Um, they're lobbying for immigration detention policies. You know, we mentioned before the American Legislative Exchange Council. And, you know, if there's a smoking gun in terms of the private prison industry, that's certainly one. Because uh, officials from the private prison corporations were at the table, they were part of the criminal justice task force at, at ALEC drafting model legislation that ALEC sent to states, and this was three strikes legislation. So yes, um, certainly, and, and in terms of lobbying and money and sort of money in politics, um, you know, both GEO Group and CoreCivic each gave, I think, $250,000 each to Trump's inaugural committee. Mm -hmm. And GEO Group gave additional funds to hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, Trump's Make America Great Again PAC. So there's certainly, um, you know, the book explores a lot of the sort of revolving doors and relationships and lobbying activity that certainly, um, certainly play a role in some of our policies. And do they get a cut off of whatever families put in for uh, phone rates or for taking care of their loved ones? Because there's always a percentage that goes in. The companies like JPay, so people call JPay yeah. the Apple of the US prison system. They provide tablets, email services. Um, they, you, know, you can send money to loved ones who are behind bars. Um, they, they do tend to give a, um, a commission to, it tends to be to the government. So in some states, you know, there might be JPay in all the prisons in the state, whether it's public or private. Um, but so, so it tends to be more, you know, this isn't really a private prison issue. This is right. a, a for-profit yeah. sector issue, but it, it, this is about the way that we run our prisons. Yeah, no, it, the, those uh, private uh, players who have come into the system to provide those sort of services, 
have done a great job of absolving government of its responsibility. So if you go back 10, 15, 20 years and you look at budgets for programming and family services and those sort of things, visitation, you find that those things may still be in the budget but at a lower dollar amount and that the people who are serving time through telephone calls and those sort of things are now actually paying for their own programming. Thank you very much. Should we go over here on the left? Hi, I have a question for Glenn. Uh, post concerning post incarceration, what do you think should be done to uh, rehabilitate, train, and integrate ex felon into society? First thing when they release is they look for work, and <coughs> all employers run back on check. That means they can never get work. Yeah, so there's a lot of research now that shows that after seven years, even people with the most serious uh, convictions um, desist from crime and don't show up as any more risky than a person who's never committed a crime for employers. Um, and so I believe that employers should be trending towards, uh, if you look at Starbucks, for instance, they don't go back beyond seven years in their background check. So I'd like to see employers have their background check policies start to more fully align with what the research is telling us. Um, but also recognizing that even from an employer's perspective, I mean, if you're cutting out a huge segment of the labor market, I mean, 70 million Americans have a criminal record on file. Uh, how is that a service to employers? I remember getting out of prison after earning a quality two-year liberal arts degree while I was in prison and visiting 50 employers within 30 days looking for a job, and this was a jobs moving a box from here to the other side of the room and being turned down over and over and over based solely on the criminal conviction. I mean, six years later, I was serving as vice president for an organization with a $20 million budget and 212 people on staff. And I just think of all those employers who were just not even allowing me to get through the door to have a discussion about whether I was uh, uh, qualified to be able to do the job and how much they lost out on, on that opportunity. So I think that as a country, we need to have a wholesale sort of look at all the policies that we've put in place to uh, reduce the amount of opportunities for people coming out of prison. We've created this entire underclass of citizenship. And the reason I keep saying that we need to be careful not to emerge from this effort to end mass incarceration, to only look up and see that we've created some other oppressive system is that if you look at the civil rights era and the things we fought for, education, employment, enfranchisement, equality, those things have been eviscerated for people who've been involved in the criminal justice system. And we call it criminal record-based discrimination, but it's a surrogate for race and class-based discrimination in this country. I have a question, I guess, similar to what you're talking about with the jobs in terms of voting. Um, what are the efforts to, um, I think it's some like handful, maybe a dozen states where if you've ever been in prison, you can't vote at all, um, talking about large sort of voting blocks in those states. So I'm, I'm wondering what are the efforts to sort of turn back legislation um, in terms of voting rights? Yeah, do you want to weigh in here? I mean, you guys have done work on this. So I have some colleagues here who work on voting rights specifically for the Brennan Center, and there's a lot of work to be done, and you're absolutely right. A lot of states will disenfranchise you for ever having gone to prison. I mean, um, I think. Alabama, Florida. Yeah. And additionally, a lot of states will, um, if you haven't paid your fees and fines, you can't vote. Um, you know, the disenfranchisement in this country is incredibly large. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are disenfranchised. So uh, I remember looking at the Sentencing Project's website just uh, on Election Day recently. And so 6 million Americans um, are ineligible to vote based on having a felony conviction. Um, but I would argue that the number is a whole lot larger uh, because the laws differ from state to state. So some states, it's pretty cut and dry. If you have a criminal record, you won't be able to vote a felony. But in some states like New York, uh, the day you get off parole, you're eligible to register and vote just like anyone else, except uh, we've done surveys with the Brennan Center going back a few years showing that uh, two-thirds of the Board of Elections get it wrong when you call them and ask the question of whether you're eligible to vote, even if the law says you have the right to vote. And so I think of how many people with criminal records actually think they'll never be able to vote again, even if uh, the law doesn't necessarily say so. I remember doing voter registration and education work in Union Square in Manhattan, and I was having formerly incarcerated folks come and talk to us about registering to vote. And I'd say one out of every two was like, I'll never be able to vote again. And I said, well, are you on parole? No. Are you 
you know, or, or they'll say, oh, I'm on probation, I, I can't vote, which is just not true in New York. And so people are sort of, uh, because of misinformation, either at the Board of Corrections or just the individual, unfortunately, I think that six million number is probably a whole lot higher. Hello, uh, thank you, LB, uh, for your time, for being here today. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that you have some recommendations in the book, and uh, I'm interested in incarcerated mothers, and I work with formerly incarcerated mothers now, children who were minors when their parents were incarcerated, to, to, to find out what their holistic approaches might be to maintaining that bond between mother and children during incarceration. So every time I come to events or go to conferences or anything, I hear about incarceration in general, mm -hmm. but in your book, do you talk about gender-specific responses, or do you talk about, or can you tell us a little bit about what you found with regards to gender-specific uh, recommendations? And that's a really wonderful question. And you know, the book itself focuses more on the intersection of profit and incarceration. It doesn't so specifically look at, at sort of gender-specific responses, but I can tell you about you know, other research that we do with the Brennan Center. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, the criminal justice system, as we know it today, um, has not been very responsive to females. And you know, there's a lot of advocacy and good work and good research happening today. Um, but you know, a lot of the research is fairly new. And there is so much research about why women are incarcerated. And so many women, the majority of women who are behind bars today, are there, um, have been a victim of domestic violence or some sort of trauma. And so when we talk about how to um, you know, improve the lives, the conditions, the reentry of women who are incarcerated today, we really need to look at why they're there. Um, and we know so much now about how to, you know, we use these risk assessment instruments, and we know so much more today than we did 40 years ago about why people might um, end up behind bars. And when we talk about rehabilitation, when we talk about increase, you know, improving the lives of these people and these women behind bars, um, you know, prison is not, for so many people and, and women, prison is just not or jail the right response, um, especially if someone's been a victim of trauma or abuse. We really need to work with them in, in different ways um, and really get to the heart of, of why they might have violated the criminal code in the first place. Uh, uh, you know, I'm glad you asked that question, if you don't mind me jumping in here. Um, you know, when you talk about the victimization of women, I think you want, if you want to increase the victimization of women, keep sending men to prison. It is the most hyper-masculine, misogynistic system that exists in our society. Um, it is paramilitary. Uh, everything about it actually teaches men the opposite of what men should be thinking about in a society where we already have so much uh, power and privilege over women. And so I think men come out uh, even worse, and I think women are more at risk as a result. Hey, uh, Zachary, I have a question about the role of quantitative research in shaping uh, private, private prison policy. So I know in your book, you know, you go a lot into kind of like, uh, you know, interviewing uh, prisoners, and that's extremely valuable. That's, uh, but I'm also curious about, I know for like the crime report, you know, you can look at like national trends, or like the effect of crime on, um, the effect of crime, on, sorry, the effect of incarceration on crime. You can look at kind of like the profiles of, you know, 40% of you know uh, prisoners probably don't need to be there. But where do you think it, the role for like someone who's like interested in the kind of like the more quantitative stuff, uh, how that can be applied to like private private prison policy? Um, that's an interesting question. You know, we at the Brennan Center do a lot of quantitative research um, to convince policymakers that we don't need incarceration uh, to have safe communities, and we do. You know, we we work a lot on. The crime rate and that 40%. I'm glad to hear you say that 40% statistic because we issued a report last year finding that 40% of people behind bars absolutely do not need to be there for any public safety reason. And that was a very conservative estimate. We can talk about that later. Um, but I think there's a huge role. I mean, you can work for, um, you can study you know, the, the differences between private and public prisons. You, you can go work for um, you know, the Department of Corrections. I, I think there's, there's a huge role for people who are quantitatively inclined. You know, working at the Brennan Center and, and believing that we need to reduce our prison populations, I would, you know, I, I'd have to say it would be great to use that those quantitative skills to really look at um, things like how many people really don't need to be in the system at all, and looking at all of the research showing that 
just about everything other than incarceration actually is more effective. Um, you know, um, drug treatments or mental health services and, and using your quantitative skills to really bolster that research I think would be really helpful, especially in a world where policymakers need data. Um, you know, I, I, I know there's this sort of this fake news, data doesn't matter anymore, but data still matters. And I think um, more and more quantitative data indicating that imprisonment is not working is beneficial. Oh, full disclosure, I was an intern at the Brennan Center uh, oh, two summers ago. Oh, I didn't recognize you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't plant that question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with uh, Oliver Rader, or okay, Rader. great. Yeah. <laughs> you go for it. Hi, uh, I, uh, I work for the Federal Office of the State of New York, uh, the Washington Office of the Governor, and um, I wanted to ask a question about the political will regarding Rikers Island. Um, I was really pleased watching the general election debate for the uh, mayoralty of New York, where, uh, as, as you said, not only has um, Bill de Blasio been a lot more bolder in addressing the need to close Rikers, but also there's uh, I mean, it's a really small sample size, but the, I mean, the audience seems very enthused as well. And there's a, the person primarying Joe Crowley. Uh, I saw her sp speak at a political rally I was working at uh, two weeks ago, and she described a lot of the base of her support in Queens as a greater willingness to close Riker, Rikers than, um, than Joe Crowley had kind of professed. So I just want to ask why there isn't greater just popular political will to close Rikers, because um, even in light of the value of the goods and services that the inmates are rendering, it just seems like the benefits are very centralized and the risks are very socialized, even to the extent that it's an underclass that's being targeted. It's um, even in light of the fact that it's people of color and uh, people with low incomes who are more likely to be incarcerated at Rikers. And, just at wildly high rates without even being properly convicted of a crime. It seems like this is a risk that's spread out over a lot of people, and uh, <coughs> the benefits of the system benefit a really small group. So why isn't it that someone could, wh why isn't it easier for someone running on just a closed Rikers platform to win a state or local office in New York, and why aren't people talking about it more? Thanks for the question, um, particularly because I've worked on a lot of advocacy and organizing campaigns, but. Uh, I'm biased here, but I have never seen a campaign catch fire as quickly as this one did. Um, and I, I, I think this is the reason why. So I studied the two previous efforts to close Rikers during the Koch administration 40 years ago. And then during the Bloomberg administration, which wasn't called close Rikers, but it was called decentralization of the jail. But the ultimate goal was to get everyone back into the community and shutter Rikers Island. And both uh, were failed attempts. Uh, the first attempt got really close, particularly because the state showed interest in the island itself. Um, the reason it failed is because the community was the last to be brought to the table. And so we built this campaign from the community outwards. In fact, we started with the people who had been most harmed by Rikers to be able to tell their stories. I saw what the impact of the Khalif Browder story was. And I said to myself, while we have 65,000 admissions at Rikers each year, the truth is that in a city of 8.5 million, the majority of New Yorkers will never go to Rikers. And so if people will never go to Rikers, how do you bring Rikers to them? How do you tell the story of the harm caused by Rikers and then challenge people people to have such a place existing in their names. And that's exactly what we did. And we did it through a huge amount of grassroots organizing. But also, we got support from people like John Legend and Kerry Kennedy and other opinion leaders that were able to um, amplify the message. So we went from people saying, you got to be kidding, close Rikers. Like, it's too difficult. It's too expensive. It'll never happen. You know, what's the plan after you close it? to uh, elected officials now fighting over who can close it sooner. In fact, you had one person say they could close it in a year which recently, which made me cringe, even as an advocate. The idea that you'd be able to shutter this facility in a year seems uh, difficult. But I got to say, it, it goes back to, I think people have always, you know, the, the New York Times every day makes the uh, argument that there's too much violence. Uh, every once in a while, they make the argument that it's too expensive. So I think New Yorkers generally have a sense that there's dysfunction at Rikers and things are not working. But in my experience, especially now after this campaign, it is the human argument that gets us to the finish line. Um, it's why we spend, it's why I don't even use words like prisoner, convict, 
convict, inmate, offender. I think those words are words given to us by the system to other the people in the system. And it's easy to put an inmate in a cell for 23 hours a day. It's a lot more difficult to put a mother, a brother, a child, a nephew in a cell. Um, so, so the shorter answer to your question is, um, I don't think we're at the finish line yet. Strangely enough, we spent so much time focusing on the mayor that we got him to the finish line more quickly than we were able to educate New Yorkers about the need to shutter Rikers, which is why we're doing billboards and television ads and all these things now to sort of get New Yorkers to catch up to where we got City Hall to end up. And then the more pragmatic response is, you have a union of 10,000 officers. You have more officers than people serving time on Rikers. And it's 85% people of color. And as a progressive mayor, you don't want to piss off a union as 85% people of color. I hate to be so practical about it, but that was part of his calculation. Thanks. So thankfully, this has been such an engaging discussion that we are running out of time. But you know, perhaps Len and LB will be around later on if you are interested. And in, in, if there's food upstairs, yeah, exactly. otherwise I'm out of here. So I, I, <laughs> I want to thank you both um, for a fascinating conversation, Glenn and LB. And I know there are copies of Inside Private Prisons upstairs if anyone wants to check it out. So thank you all very much uh, for coming out tonight. This has been terrific. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.